As was indicated, this is the evening I plan to give you a report on the last trip that I made. I have tried to indicate here uh, Murmansk and Russia, the very northern part of that part of Russia, then across Russia and China to, to Taiwan, ultimately to Taichung, then down into Cambodia. And I want to start this presentation as I start all of them by thanking you. You on these trips have encouraged me not only financially, but in so many different ways. Your, your interest in the trips, your comments, your return comments on Facebook, which are very much an encouragement when you're in a, you're in a different and a somewhat strange different land. I thought this time I'd spend just a second. I, I know last time the trip involved China, and I talked about the difficulty that I had in, in getting a visa. I, I don't know traveled, but this is what a visa, this is the Russian visa. Some parts of it I can read, some parts of it I cannot. But you have to send your passport, in my case, into Houston, and then you wait some time while an agency there transfers it to the appropriate embassy. I didn't know whether I would have troubles again, but the problem is we have to answer the questions honestly. And when I answer, answer them honestly, I indicate that my employer is the Church Church of Christ. And I know in the case of China, that seemed to attract some attention. I felt like mine was very, barely approved, and there were some brethren who were planning to travel about the same time. Ultimately, they did not get approval for the dates that they wanted. But it was not a problem with Russia. But that's a, a part of the process that's somewhat time-consuming and, and maybe brings a little anxiety to the journey. I thought I would just tell you something about catching the plane there. This time I went to Los Angeles, Los Angeles International Airport. You gather your bags and you make a separate journey over to a completely separate terminal. In this case, that airline was Airflot, a Russian airline, and you can see the, uh, the terminal there. And what I want you to maybe appreciate is there is a whole row of these things, maybe, I don't know, 25 terminals. That's just for the Airflot. This whole big terminal building, this very confusing to me, even though I've done this a few times, there's just a lot of places you have to go and you've got to get to the right place or you're never going to get to your ultimate destination. Finally, I got to the gate, had a flight at 4.25 in the afternoon, you can see it was kind of interesting to me. It's off to the side there was a room where all the crew was gathering. And each of these international carriers, they always dress in, in, in country appropriate attire. So there they are getting ready to help us on the plane. On the plane, on the back of the seat in front of you, there is a little um, a screen. And you can see this maps the journey that's going to go from Los Angeles over here to, to Moscow, then I want to up to Murmansk. And you see the plane right there? You see this right here is an indication of the day-night line. And what I pretty quickly figured out was I wasn't going to get to, to the nighttime for my long journey. I was going to be trying to rest during the day as the thing went along. You can see that this day-night line goes this direction. You see it's progressed over to here. The plane has gone this way. And ultimately, when I was almost there, uh, very much of the day, daytime period, and in fact, the old uh, the screen of the, of the phone, you see here, sunrise at 5, sunset at 10.34, and that feels kind of strange. If I had been there three weeks earlier, the sun would have never set. This particular location is that far north. There's a two-month period in the summer that the sun never sets, two-month period in the wintertime when the sun never rises. So... I was glad I was going through the time that it, uh, it was up a lot. Arrived at the Murmansk Airport. You see the raininess there on the previous weather screen. It says it's rainy in 53, and it was rainy part of the time that we were there. Murmansk, this is the more typical picture. It's on the north. It's by the, by the seas and a lot of shipping that occurs there. So that's kind of the preliminaries. Getting there, uh, these are two guys that I've been corresponding with, of course, for some months. person on the left is Cliff Lyons. Person on the right is Ilya. Cliff Lyons, I kind of almost had a connection with. Um, some of you may remember that uh, before I became a preacher, I was worshiping with the church up in Woodbridge, Virginia for 18 years. That congregation, Cliff Lyons, was the very first preacher, full time preacher for that congregation some 50 years ago. So I heard his name many times. What a good guy. How blessed they've been. I think it's, you know, a dozen years or more that he's been at the work there in Murmansk. And Ilya, uh, of course, is, is the Russian, was converted a number of years ago, and I tell you, he is, he is the, one of the mainstays in the work. He is Cliff's right arm in terms of getting things done. 
Cliff does not try to spend full time there in romance. And Ilya is the one who carries the burden. He's the one, as you'll see, did a lot of translation of the slides before I got there to make the sermons and uh, presentations more effective. Ilya, uh, we, we have a wonder bro wonderful brother in Christ in that, in that part of the world. Uh, Cliff has an apartment there. It wasn't very large. The rooms weren't very large. There's quite a bit of things in that room even before my things were added to it. But that was my humble abode for the few days that I was there in Murmansk. Cliff prepared several of the meals for us. In the corner of the kitchen there, you can see the table where we ate. Had much good fellowship around that particular table. But we didn't go there to eat. Uh, we went there to preach the gospel. And they had asked me if I could provide some funds ahead of time. They advertised. I got a very strong impression that they are hard workers there in Murmansk. Uh, the advertising, the advanced advertising, that's a picture of the trolley, and that's Ilya, Ilya's profile there. Um, when I got there, they gave me a, a, a one-week trolley pass. That's how you get back and forth to where you're going. I don't know that I met anybody, any of the Christians while I was there, that actually had their own car. You get around my trolleys, the trolleys weren't very frequently. But you might notice, you see that very greenish-looking piece of paper? They're able to pay... You don't go on the trolley and post these pieces of paper on the trolley, but you pay the trolley company. I think they paid 150 or more for over a two or three week period to have these flyers placed on a number of the different trolleys. A lot of exposure, a lot of people um, ride the trolleys. And they also took out some ads in the local newspaper, uh, advertising the meeting, you can see the 16th, 17th, and 18th. At least the numbers we can read. <laughs> 16, 17, 18 of August. Um, advertising, uh, we also went, several of the evenings people went out and posted, put posters on some of the bulletin boards that are outside the different apartment buildings. There you can see Ilya pasting up one or taping one up in the area there. Uh, also, we went out on the streets and actually handed out flyers people who were passing by. It's uh, a lot of traffic in the area that's not very far from the church building. And I'll tell you, we don't do that a lot over here. In the beginning, it was kind of uncomfortable for me, I'll acknowledge. I don't like walking through the malls, having people put those surveys or whatever it is, poke them at me. So I was a little uncomfortable in that until I figured out what I was going to do. And that was I wasn't going to poke it at them. When I was meeting somebody, I would just stand still and I would just hold it out. And I think they appreciated that. i got to believe that the people that walked by me, 60, 70, maybe more percent of the people, stopped and took the flyer. But passing out the flyers, uh, they do that. Um, seems to work. Something worked. Because at least one person was a visitor there. It's a fairly small group. Maybe, I don't know, 14, 16, 18 people. But they did have some visitors there. It seemed to have been the result of some of the advertising. At least one, possibly two. And I thought I would show you from the sessions there, that was one of the Bible study sessions, I believe, and there, that was the group that was assembled. And you see Cliff there on the right, and the guy kind of in the middle, hopefully you recognize. Um, I guess they're kind of noted for having a very stern and not very expressive disposition. And uh, I found that to be the case. Not that they're unfriendly. Um, they just don't emote <laughs> with their faces like many of us do over here. I want you to notice these two guys right here. Cliff, on the right, the one who's the full-time American, not, well, full-time responsibility for the work, although he doesn't spend 12 months a year there. But I was really clever in some of the arrangements that he made. I was going to be there for a few days with my meeting. This guy right here came to do a series on personal evangelism. So what Cliff did is, several of the preachers that he knew, this guy right here is from the Ukraine, uh, Roma, and this guy right here is from another area. I have other pictures of them later in Russia. He gathered those guys in out of his work fund. He paid for their train trips to get them there. So we had two or three additional people from across Russia. Had an opportunity to, uh, to hear the lessons that I presented. Had an opportunity to be there for the uh, personal evangelism training. But that was the assembly, one of the groups of the, of the people who was there at the and there somebody else was taking the pictures, but again, um, you see a difference in the demeanor between the guy on the left and the guy on the right. Um, maybe that's not quite fair. Maybe he always took the picture when I was talking, so of course the translator wouldn't be quite as animated. Ilya, 
Gil is a good guy, uh, not the most animated translator that I ever had. But I, I thought uh, he translated the slides before I went there, and I tell you, not only do they have a chance to see it in their language during the presentation, but we have the handouts. And so the people that are there are able to take lessons on these fundamentals, a matter of worship, why we do not use mechanical instruments of music, and on salvation, why faith only does not save. So they're able to have the handouts in their own language and uh, take it with them. I was commenting before, yeah, I certainly don't understand Russian, can't speak Russian, but at least you can recognize the characters. It's a combination of the English alphabet and for the most part, the Greek alphabet. If you know some of the Greek characters, and the Greek characters that are there tend to have the same pronunciation they have in the Greek language. The thing that looks like a P in many cases is the Greek row, and it has an R sound. So I think if I'd have paid more attention at the beginning, I think by the time I left, I would have been able to recognize, because a lot of the terms are just like transliterated. Restaurant, if you sound it out with the English letters and the Russian letters, the Greek letters and Russian, you can figure out a lot of the things. But it was so nice to have those the slides translated. And you'll see one of them in the back here. Here's the answer. It could not be simpler. Christian, he was the Bible says that we are baptized into that one place of safety. It is baptism that puts a person into Christ. What does that mean? That means that if a person has not been baptized, that person is not in Christ. That means that that person does not have that salvation that is available only in Christ. Sad to say, that means that person is lost. I was just kind of struck in the picture. I don't know whether I can back up a little bit. The red, white, and blue, that's not the U.S. flag, that's the Russian flag. It could not be here is the gospel that's being preached, the symbols below that. Um, in Russia, the church does not have to be underground, can be advertised, as I've indicated, but it still is under a lot of government restrictions. Some of the facilities that they have obtained there in, in Murmansk, they're not able to use because of restrictions on, on their particular use. Uh, I mentioned that I talked about the other guy. This is uh, uh, Vladimir from a place further, further, um, further east in Russia. Met him at the train station. He rode the train about 60 hours to get from where he was. They said, "Well, after the train ride, he's going to need some rest." Well, I thought you rested on the train 60 hours. I enjoy the trains for about 24 hours, somewhere in there's about nine hours then, you know, my span of concentration. But we went down to the station to meet him on the train, and uh, here's, here's uh, Ilya, here's Vladimir, and the two of them walking away, I was just kind of struck by the picture. Two of our brethren, preachers in Russia, known each other for a number of years, buddies, and thanks to this assembly of people, not just for my meeting, but for the series of evangelistic lessons, together again. I tell you, uh, we have some wonderful brethren, wonderful brethren around the world. Uh, we did get together at a restaurant there. You can see there's Cliff, there's me, there's the guy who came from the evangelistic series. And there's Roma from the Ukraine. And there's Vladimir. Roma in particular, I probably spent more time with him, except for Ilya, not in the others. Uh, in the area where he is in the Ukraine, there are some of the churches. They're not teaching, but it's okay to drink socially, but they're saying, you know, we really don't see that compelling evidence from Scripture. We see the arguments, we're just not that convinced by them. Well, the approach that I use is a little bit different. So I spent some time talking to Ilya and to Roma over at the place where they were staying, studying with them a different approach, and they were going to take that back and see if perhaps they would be more effective than some of their brethren to convince them that the consumption of beverage alcohol is wrong at any amount at any time. But what a joy, <laughs> sitting here with these brethren, maybe studying some topics with them to help them back in their home congregations. 
So, what a joy. Uh, there are those two. I think everybody knows travel, foreign travel is really about the international cuisine. <laughs> and I wanted you to know after the last journey that I, I was able to find some place besides the McDonald's. I, uh, I ate at McDonald's a few times, and after I took that picture, it was on my cell phone, the way that I ordered in Russia or China, the way I ordered was I walked up to the counter and I just showed them that picture. <laughs> True. <laughs> I just showed them Russian China, showed them the picture, they looked at the picture, and I got what I wanted every time. <laughs> Actually, I may start doing that in the U.S. because in the U.S. I don't mess with it. <laughs> but for those of you who are interested, um, in terms of McDonald's, China, number one, clearly number one. The fries are the best. The Big Mac looks like a Big Mac, not this little bitty thing that you get over here. Russia is number two. But they, uh, Subway just opened across the street there from Cliff's apartment. They hadn't even tried it yet. And, uh, and I laugh, but I tell you that I'm not always with the brethren. And to be able to go someplace where I have, where I believe that through a picture or some way I can order something that is going to be very compatible with my digestive system, it is a blessing. I mean, I've traveled at times a number of years ago where that wasn't the case. This takes a lot of the anxiety away. But there we go. In Russia, the McDonald's and Subway. Uh, on the way back, uh, on the way from from uh, from Russia over to Taiwan, I did fly. Instead of flying down to Moscow, I flew down to St. Petersburg uh, and walked uh, a fair distance there and saw a couple of the sites and took this train, the Russian train from Burmans, from uh, from St. Petersburg down to Moscow and from there across line plane that went back, you know, further across the country. Uh, the high-speed train in Russia wasn't quite as high as the one that I was in number four. This is only like 150, 155 miles an hour, but I did a fair amount of walking, but they have some interesting architecture there. And I wanted to mention, uh, speaking of the train, you may remember from the last briefing, I said, here I am, two big roller bags and a carry-on bag that was a roller bag. And I'm at the train station there in China, and I'm looking at a set of stairs, and I'm thinking, how am I going to do this? Well, I revised my packing strategy, you know, based on that. Now what I have is I have one big bag. The little thing that you can unzip and make it bigger, I did that. So I've got one really big bag. That's my little carry-on. Because before, when I was at that train station, and I had the two big bags, and then the, the carry-on that was a roller, yeah, that was not good. So I decided, I decided to revise that. I have a new packing strategy I'll briefly share with you. I've got the really big bag that I can get almost everything in. But it's overweight for the airlines. So what I do is in one compartment, I have this little red smaller bag. So I pull my one big bag up to the check-in counter. I unzip it. I take the smaller one out, zip it back up. I have two bags to check both that are within the weight limits of the airlines. So when I need to optimize for weight, I can optimize for weight, but I'm having to tote it around, I can carry it around. Okay, so no extra charge for the travel tickets. Got across the country, and I'm so glad to see John. I mean, I was with you know other brethren there in Russia that took good care of me, but John has kind of become a friend. And I knew, I knew John Grubb would take good care of me. And I thought he was until in the email he said that uh, when we got into Taiwan, first we flew into Taipei, he said we'd be staying at a hostel. Well, I haven't necessarily heard good things about hostels in my life. <laughs> but I'm trusting John Grubb. And we stayed at the Taipei Teacher's Hostel. And I tell you, it, it really wasn't too bad. It was a decent looking place. The room was a very small room, but I tell you, it was one of the cleanest and neatest rooms that we stayed in. So I have learned, we talked this morning in class about prejudice. I have learned to overcome a prejudice against the name hospital. Very good place to stay there. Um, did a little looking around there with John and uh, and the way that he gets from Taipei down to Taichung is, is the train. And what a blessing. I mean, before, some of my worst experiences traveling have been at train station. With John Grubb, it's not a problem. I just stand there and watch the bags, and he goes and gets the ticket. <laughs> but he takes me down to the 7 Elevens are all over the place, and you get something, you know, a snack on the train. But uh, there it was. But I did uh, take my GPS 
and it moves along pretty well, 180 miles an hour. And actually, the GPS that I have takes a new data point every few minutes or every few seconds, and I went back. That thing went 185 miles an hour during part of the journey. So um, I think Taiwan is the winner of the high-speed train race there. The Turkey to Taishan, uh, if you notice the stairs, when I got back from this journey, I felt like I had returned from a step class. <laughs> the, uh, the, the church was on the third floor, and Cliff's apartment was on the fourth floor. It was the other way around. I was no elevators. I was walking up and down stairs. I'm sure it was very good for me. Um, <laughs> I, I assume that the premium properties are probably on the ground floor. And if you want something that's fairly economical, then you have to be willing to go up a few flights of stairs. <coughs> out front of this building, there are a lot of signs along the streets in, the, in, in Taiwan. Here, uh, this is John Yo. He is the preacher for the congregation there in Taichung. And this is the banner that advertises. There's the Church of Christ sign. This is the banner. And if you have noticed on Facebook, you may have seen some of those issues, uh, uh, images. They have a lot of, again, good advertising, good banners. They really tried to make the most uh, of the opportunities with the meeting there. And the church building there was small, very clean, very neat. Over in this corner was a little kitchen area they could use. And back to the back was a room they used for the, the dinners on the ground or for the meals. And I was just struck. I mean, <laughs> how do you tell a church of Christ? Well, it's got a bulletin board with notices on one side and pictures of the congregation on the other. <laughs> I, thought that, I thought that was great. The preacher who was there was... A oh,
When John translated them, I was struck how efficient, economical the Chinese language is. Uh, he likes to put the English and the Chinese on there together, and for the most part, you can do that because you can say a lot in a short period of space with the, with the Chinese there. You know, the Russian, I think I could learn to pick out the characters between the English and the Greek, I don't think. <laughs> well, John, one reason I think John came over was he knows some of the people there so well. He lived there for 10 years. That's how he learned to be such an expert in Mandarin Chinese. And this particular slide right here, I just tell you, you'll see this. I'm going to give you a video of me preaching and John translating. And this is one of the ones that you'll see there. The first one was taking the video, kind of zoomed in on the slide in the end. And man is not saved by his own works. But we are not saved by our own works. We are not saved by our own works. But James is talking about works that are really obedient actions to God. But the Yahweh's meaning is that the works are to be to be to be to be to be to be And it's in that sense of the word works that he says that man is justified by works, not by faith only. So he means that we are not saved by our own works. 观修神旨意，就得救而不是单信心而已。It was just enjoyable being with John. I knew it would be good in terms of preaching experience, but he's a he's a, a, a very uh, a very amiable travel companion. That was great. Uh, we did we did make some visits there. The woman on the left, a very scholarly person, tenured teacher in one of the schools there, teaches English. Uh, had attended the congregation in the past, had attended recently for a while, they went over to her house to have a worship service there so she could participate, and they weren't able to do that anymore, but they wanted to go see her, and we did, and she was talking about coming back and, and meeting with them again, and said, sure, there were some things in her life that had been a distraction, but now they can begin to come back to her house and hold services again, so it seemed to be a good visit. This was particularly interesting. This is John Yo and his son. This was a young man who had been part of the congregation and had some drug problems. And so one evening, it must have been an hour and a half, we drove up in the mountain, a very remote location. But there was a drug and alcohol rehabilitation center. I had a chance to chat with them for a while. And uh, I'm so grateful. Once again, I know I miss this often for my association with the guys in the Howe Foundation because I was able to share with them at least some of the things that I think that I may have learned from them. So couple of good visits there that seem to have been helpful to people. Uh, this is not just about the cuisine. Uh, John is extremely conscientious in what he eats. He drinks about a barrel full of water every day. He's always in the markets picking out the fresh fruits. The subways that were over there, there were times that we drove, I think, an extra 10, 12 minutes. Even when they had the dinner on the ground, John went over to the subway and got something to eat and brought it back put it on the table and then on the ground. So uh, very conscientious and again, grateful. Laugh about it, but grateful for some of the American restaurants that are over there. Next place is to Cambodia. The guy on the right is Fanat Booch. He graduated from the Southwest School of Bible Studies. Um, I forgot now, 2007, 2008, 2009. Um, he was a classmate of Justin Guest. Justin Guest was one of the, the, the guys who was a young man from the congregation of Judah when I was there, so I kind of kept up with him. He's a preacher down in Mathis. And I was talking to him about places he'd been, or I saw something on the internet. He was extremely enthused about the work of this young Greek, primarily because one of his classmates, Fanet, was the director of the school there. Uh, Fanet wasn't even born in Cambodia. He, I think he said he was born in Thailand. Uh, all the way out of the country. His parents were, were immigrating, but they were in refugee camp, I think. Came to the U.S., he learned to speak the Khmer language because his parents did. Came over, educated in U.S. schools, was in the Austin area. I think some of the people from Southwest, some of the Christians there, I don't know somebody from the school or just the Southwest Church of Christ, found him in some way, converted him, taught him the gospel, he made the gospel, then he went to preaching school. Now he has chosen to go back in this family to be in uh, Simri, Cambodia. Oh, what a bright, intelligent, good Bible student that guy was. And only when I got, well, there's the Simri, the Simri Church of Christ, and the Bible 
school that is there also. There's Fanat and his wife and family. And only on the last couple of days that I was there, I spent most of the time with Fanat and Fanat did a lot of the translating. But Fanat had to go participate in some benevolent activity. They were giving life vests to the children. There were some children in an area that was not too far away that they were concerned about going to school because they had to go across water. So they were declining to go to school because of concerns about their safety. The church bought well, how many hundreds of the life vests and went there and passed them out. And I thought, wow, maybe we should look around for a really needed opportunity like that. It wasn't, wasn't some made-up thing, you know, like a car wash. A very distinct need that the church was involved in. But anyhow, so when he was gone, Chan, as they called him, was there, was doing the translating. I got to know him a little bit better. He's been there as the preacher of the congregation for six, seven years. Been there, I think, about twice as long as the man has. Two, <laughs> good, sound, excellent, brethren, part of the work there. Uh, this was, I think, the Wednesday night Bible class. One of the works there is an orphanage. Completely separate from the church, no commingling of funds. They're doing it in a very appropriate and scripture way. But they're making a lot of contacts and that, and of course, in the Bible classes, they have a lot of the children that are there from the orphanages. This is one picture uh, that I took of the class. Um, I had an opportunity to teach the classes of the students that were there as a part of the Bible school, as a part of the preaching school. And you'll see there are a number of women in the class. And conscientious, it was great. But I think of all the things that impressed me, the thing that impressed me most, I think they had three classes come through there. Out of those three classes, there are seven husband-wife combinations that are now working to spread the gospel. Not only did the, the preacher, the graduating preacher, go through the school, but his wife went through the school also. Probably in some cases they were not husband and wife when they started there. But think about seven strong husband-wife combinations preaching the gospel in Cambodia. I thought, I thought that was impressive. Now, it ends again with kind of a travel note. I, some of you, many, maybe all of you, maybe everybody <laughs> knew that Anger Wat was there in that, in that part of Cambodia and said, I didn't even know what it was until I started talking about going there. I wanted to go there because the school was there, because Justin Guest told me about Fanat. But people began to tell me about this Anger Wat. 3,000-year-old temple complexes within a few miles of one another. Very old. Interesting places, no doubt. Pretty good security. Yeah, they had to make you up a picture ID before you could get into it. But only after I left did I learn about what, to me, was the most interesting part. And that is, in one of these three temple complexes, in the corner of one of them, there's a set of carvings. And I'll give you a slightly enlarged view. If I press the right button here. And the one I want to call your attention to is somewhere about here. It's this one right here. Can you see the little animal right there? That one right there. If you, if you zoom in a little bit more, you can see my hand. Can you see that? It kind of looks like a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. Well, the closer you get to it, the more like a dinosaur it looks. Yeah. And after I learned about that, I was got on the internet over there and Googled it. And interestingly enough, there was an article by Eric Lyons about this. Eric Lyons is the son of Cliff Lyons. So I kind of started with the Cliff Lyons story and ended up with the Eric Lyons story. I'm not sure exactly what to make about that, but that means something. For the evolutionists to talk about the billions and the billions of years and the dinosaurs were extinct hundreds of millions, tens or hundreds of millions of years before man was on the earth. I don't know how they explain that picture. But somebody, a thousand years ago, carved that picture that looks very, very much like one particular class of dinosaurs. Now, I don't know where that person that carved that picture, where they got that image. They didn't look it up on Facebook. This I know. <laughs> how did they know what that dinosaur, they didn't look it up in the Britannica either. How did they know if they hadn't seen one? I'm not sure what all that means, but that definitely means something. But that was intriguing to me. I told for that. I got to go. Of course, he knew about it. He knew right where it was. Took me right to it. I want to see that one for myself. That's intriguing. And as some of you saw on the Facebook, uh, 
Yeah. Took the ride on the elephant. I don't think Fanat had ever ridden on the elephant. So we, for $15, that's better than a roller coaster ride, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said, how was it on the elephant? Well, once you got on there, that little thing kind of does this. Yeah. You get, once you get on there, it's not too bad of a ride. And we got the um, oldest elephant there. The elephant was 50-some-odd years old. So I don't think they gave it to me because I was the oldest guy that was there. I don't think that was the case. But the elephant was big. And by big, I mean, it's like it's not a one-story walk-up, but you got to walk up a, a, a fair distance there to get on there. But that was kind of interesting, and that was kind of the conclusion. But what would I have to end with? <laughs> You know, I've seen the, I mean, the Kentucky Fried Chicken and the McDonald's, and I was custom to Subway, but when I walked into the airport to depart Sim Reap, Cambodia, and I saw a Dairy Queen, <laughs> I thought, ah, almost back to Texas, almost. <laughs> but again, you know, I had some place to eat before I got on that long combination of long flights. Something I knew, that, uh, something that was familiar to me. But anyhow, I, I thank you all once again for your encouragement in so many different ways for these journeys. And um, I think there are brethren in three different places now that have been encouraged, at least that somebody would come, uh, come that far to visit them. And the lessons are kind of tried and true. I present pretty much the same lesson each place I go. The fundamentals of salvation, the fundamentals of worship. And I was interested there in Cambodia. I asked them, you know, if Fernando was translating, I said, you know, you think they're comprehending this pretty well? He says, they get it. And he seemed so pleased that I was emphasizing, you know, some of the fundamentals. It's, it's almost always good to hear the same message presented in maybe the same, maybe a slightly different way from a different person. A lot of reinforcement. Able to preach the gospel. Able to teach people who are going to be in the future preaching the gospel in Cambodia. I thought that was great. Again, I thank you all for it.